questions answered that you want to get answered. <laughs> All right, good evening, guys. How's everybody doing? Hopefully we get a little snow tonight. Uh, thank you guys for coming. We will get started. Uh, my clock says 6 o'clock. Those are a little fast, but as always, I do like to start on time to respect everybody's time. Uh, so hopefully there will be a few more people trickling in. Um, but if not, again, we always do record these and post, post them on YouTube in case you can't come. I always suggest coming just because they're online doesn't mean that you get to miss out on all the awesome experience. But it is also a great time to ask questions when you are here. Uh, but if you're not here and you're watching this, I, you can email me questions, and I'm happy to answer them. Um, but we will be using some of those handouts, so hopefully you guys have them. If you guys don't, there's a whole slew of them back there. Uh, this is Emily Wexler. How many of you guys have met Emily before in the past? If not, she is, what is your code, the chairperson, the boss of the uh, Learning Bridges of the Sierra. Which is a local nonprofit kind of college counseling, financial aid slash help you get into college group um, that does a lot of good stuff for some of our students. Um, so Emily will actually be uh, talking through a lot of this presentation tonight, and I will be piping in and answering questions and talking more a little bit more about kind of what we do here locally and what we have going on from a school and some of our local scholarships and that kind of thing. Um, before we get actually diving into the presentation, I do want to remind you that financial aid is a very individual topic. Everything is very hyper-individualized. So the person you're sitting next to is probably going to have a much different situation than you. So because of that, it's very difficult in a large group setting to cover very specific information regarding everyone's you know, individual status of their finances and what award you're going to get and what you're going to qualify for. So a lot of what we're going to cover tonight is a little bit more generalized. We'll be covering kind of some of the awards that are available, some of the general things of how to find out maybe what some financial aid um, money that you have uh, access to, and how to access some additional award money that's not things like government aid, so things like scholarships and that kind of thing. Um, but we will take questions at the end, and then, uh, and I also will highlight an event we will have in January too. Um, that's called file your FAFSA night. So like if you need help filing your FAFSA, some of you guys have other kids, you've probably done it tons and tons of times, but some people for the first time it's a little intimidating. So um, if you have questions, we're a small group, so just go ahead and raise your hand and we'll try to address them. Um, I said 7.30, I really don't think we'll take that long. Um, so we'll get out of here as soon as we get done with our material and we answer all your guys' questions. Anybody have any questions or things like, I really want you to talk about this before we get started. All right. Uh, so I'm going to let Emily kind of kick it off, and she can walk us through a little bit of the presentation, and then we will get rolling. Great. Thanks, Jeff. Um, hi, my name is Emily Wexler. I'm the Executive Director for Learning Bridge of the Sierra. Uh, that would be this item in your packet. Um, so Learning Bridge is a local nonprofit. We operate on a sliding scale. We're, our office is over at Truckee High School in Portable M5. And we're here to help you, no matter what income level you are, with what it is you want to do after college, whatever that might be. And lately, we've also had a lot of adults who've been out of high school a long time who realize that they want more training or whatever. And we can help you with that too. So we start the whole process off with figuring out what school is the best for you. Most of you have already applied. Are you guys seniors? Yeah. So you've already applied to school. So now we're into financial aid season where we help people with their financial aid documents, the FAFSA, the profile, um, and then we help later when they come back and they're mistakes, right? Um, so <laughs> we help through the whole thing. This is the talk that I usually affectionately refer to as, what the FAFSA? Wait, <laughs> so, uh, hey, Simon, can you turn up Emily's mic real quick? Can, can you, am I not holding it close enough? I think people here can hear you, but I want to make sure that it's picking up the camera. Uh, no, the no, red one. Red. <laughs> the there other we one. go. Now Thanks. I can hear myself think. Okay, so anyway, so what the FAFSA? FAFSA is the terrifying term uh, that you're hearing a lot of lately. Anyone know what it stands for? Excellent. Federal. Federal something. Yeah. Let me fill in the blanks. It stands for Free Application for Federal Student Aid. So it really is FAFSA, despite how horrible that sounds. Um, and the, the first word in there is very important, it's free. So, as you're approaching financial aid, keep in mind that it 
it should be free to get financial aid and scholarships. You should never pay money for a service that gets it for you. That is a scam. Okay, so with that said, let's jump into the presentation. Um, this is sort of more of an overview presentation of the whole world of going to college, but um, here's the things that are strange about applying to college. Um, when you're a senior, or when you're a junior, of course, hopefully you visited some schools and made some selections about where you wanted to apply. Um, summer after your junior year, you finalized your list, and if you were an athlete, you filed your um, NCAA registration. Uh, fall of your senior year, you already applied to colleges, right? If you're seniors, not, you applied. You're almost done, if not done. Okay, <laughs> good. Um, and then winter of your senior year, you apply for financial aid. So the point I want to make here is that the application to college process is completely separate from the application for money process. Two separate processes, and they're not linked. Okay, <laughs> so next. Um, this is to point out how strange this process is. So normally, when you want something like that new iPad, right, you figure out, hey, I want that iPad. The first thing you do is you identify what you want, and then you figure out how much it costs. Okay, too much for me, but I want it anyway. Um, and then you see if you have the money, and then you buy it if you can, right? That's how most people shop for things. Well, in college, it's a little bit different. You first find the colleges you like, then you apply to the college without having a clue as to how much it's going to cost. Right? That was weird. Some of you looked at the college price tags and went, how on earth is this going to work? Right? <laughs> okay, so a little strange. Then you apply for financial aid after January 1st, and then you see if you get admitted on that academic timeline, and after that, after that, you find out if you can afford it. So, um, college shopping is weird. It's weird, right? It's not normal. So just keep that in mind <laughs> that, yes, it feels weird, and yes, it seems out of order, and that's totally normal. Uh, so, let's see. If we, oh, we've got the wrong, I sent you the wrong example. Let me tap. That's right. They have extra <laughs> examples now that they can take home with them. Extra examples. So um, let's, can you guys read those numbers up there, or shall I go with the example? Okay. So um, what you're, here is what you would see if you went to the website for UC Merced back in, I think this was 2010, 11, yeah. And by law, the federal government requires any school that distributes federal aid to post this box of information. It's called the cost of attendance. And it always includes room and board, so housing and food, tuition, fees, transportation, and personal expenses, and an estimation of books. Okay, so some of you are smart and thinking, I could make that number smaller, right? So let's talk about some ways that first you can knock some numbers off of this. Hey, well, I got a question. Yeah, go right Where in. can I find this box on a school's website? <laughs> that's, that's an excellent, excellent question, Joe. Um, the answer is, if you just Google cost of attendance and your college name, it'll come up. Yeah, most in most cases, and if it doesn't, you can complain to the feds. <laughs> so get them in trouble for not posting it. Uh, so the total cost of attendance is $29,002 back in 2010, which is a terrifying number for most families. Right? That is a lot of cash to lay out for college. So the first thing we want to do is try and reduce that number. So starting at the top, tuition and fees, those are fixed costs. So if you're taking notes here, I would write fixed next to that. You can't get them to change that. There's no wiggle room in there. Those are fixed. The next item is health insurance. Um, some of you believe that your health insurance is better or cheaper or more um, comprehensive than what the school is offering. Nine times out of ten, it's not. Um, but it is worth looking into because if you're lucky enough to have better insurance that's cheaper, stick with it. And that is negotiable. You don't have to pay their health, in health insurance fee if you have your own insurance. But generally speaking, colleges' health insurance is the cheapest, best health insurance around. Okay, so next, room and board. Okay, so the thing you want to know about the room and board in the um, cost of attendance calculation is that it's based on your student living with one other student, so a student in a double, eating the biggest meal plan. Okay, so someone like me, am I going to eat the same amount as the 275-pound linebacker? No. 
right? Okay, so you do want to take that into account um, because it's likely that your student is not going to require you know, three meals a day, seven days a week. It's likely that they really only want two and a snack or something like that. And most meal plans are very flexible now. So you can knock off a couple hundred dollars, a couple, sometimes thousand um, dollars off of that item right there. Also, modern dorms have bigger rooms than doubles. They often have quads or sextets now, um, apartment suites that you can have multiple roommates. So you can also reduce the cost of living by having more roommates, right? Um, so, one word of warning about having more roommates though, for example, at Cal Poly, Cal Poly loves to shove three or four people in a room that fits two people and call it cheaper, but you're really living in like a 10 by 12 dorm room with four other people, so be, just be wary when you, when you know what you're signing up for, you may be signing up for like a little itty bitty cube in like five feet of personal space. So just be aware. It might save you money, but it might make you crazy. <laughs> this, this is completely true. And um, I might also add that the newer dorms um, are much more space oriented. Um, for example, Sonoma State. All their dorms are less than 10 years old and they have these lovely open suites and common areas. And anyway, so, you know, go visit before you commit. Uh, moving right along, books and supplies. Okay, the books and supplies calculation is based on books at full price. Who here buys books at full price? Anyone? No. No one does this anymore. So, <laughs> once you go to college, you'll stop doing that. Um, no, so books, most people buy them online now, or the bookstore sells or rents the books, so you don't actually have to pay that full cost, so you can reduce that pretty significantly. The caveat is if you're engineering, they don't reduce it much. Um, we, I'm an engineer, and I will tell you that engineering textbooks start at like $400 a piece, and no one sells them. Okay, so anyway, <laughs> moving right along, but English majors have the option there. There's also often a lot of times with the textbooks, um, more and more now you're seeing a lot of like ebooks, uh, electronic textbooks for like your computer or iPad or that kind of thing, and those are also great ways to save money because those are typically way reduced because there's not the printing costs involved and there's, there's less licensing fees and distribution and a lot of stuff. So you're typically going to get that at a much cheaper price than paying even for a used book at times. Definitely true. And also asking your professor if you can get an older version of a textbook. So they might have a new version, but typically they change like a chapter or two at the end and add a hundred bucks to it and call it version 12 instead of 11 but it's usually got the same other stuff that you probably can get copies from somebody else of that one chapter they added. Totally, totally the truth. Um, <laughs> come talk to Jeff about these things. Um, personal expenses, that is about how many times do you need to buy your roommate's pizza? I don't know, how many? How many times do you need to get your nails done? These are personal expenses, right? So it is up to you. That's always based on an average estimate based on the cost of living in the area. So yeah, you can reduce that significantly, just be thrifty. Um, transportation is not what you think it is. Transportation is the cost of getting to and from campus. Um, when you leave home and go to campus, come home for Thanksgiving, go back. Come home for Christmas, go back. Come home during the spring, go back. And stay until the end and then come home. That's what the transportation cost is about. It is not about getting around town while you're at school. So that's how that's calculated, and of course, it's an estimate. Um, for our California schools, they're talking about the cost for all of their students, depending on where they live in California, to get there, right? So if, you if you're going to Chico, it's a lot cheaper than going to Santa Barbara, right? So work those into your calculations. Uh, a dead spot right there. Okay, how financial aid works. Okay, ready? Take a deep breath. Yeah. Breath and follow these Oh, I'm creating a dead spot. Okay, there we go. Um, so first you want to apply to college, as we talked about. And then apply for financial aid, which you're about to start on January 1st. Um, and then you're going to check out your financial aid offers in the spring. Okay, so this sounds pretty simple. First, a couple of warnings. Do not start filling out your FAFSA today. Okay? Your information will be lost on January 1st when they update to next year's. 
There is no point in starting today online. There is point to, however, printing out, or I bet Jeff has paper copies of the FAFSA in his office, um, that you can start filling in the information on paper. So you're ready to go on January 1st. That's a smart thing to do. Yeah, rough draft on paper. Uh, one thing you can't start, though, is doing the pin, right? Yes. So that's, that's one thing that I would definitely advise. So because everything's electronic, there's something called a pin, which you apply for, which the student and the parent apply for um, online, and it's a way to electronically sign your FAFSA. So this is something that typically, right around January 1st, when everybody's deciding to hop on there, the system will die, it will bog down, it'll take three weeks to get the pin back. So starting that in advance would be beneficial to you. If you have a child that has gone to college and you filled out the FAFSA already, you already have a pin. You don't have to make a new one. You might need to recover your pin because you forgot it. But that's all linked on the FAFSA website. Uh, I don't know if we have a link to the FAFSA website. I can. I don't. It's fafsa.ed.gov, I believe. Uh, it's on this handout. Yes. But that site also has a link to the PIN site. It's, it looks very similar. But I would start that process, you know, this week. And then most likely, before the big rush, they usually get back to you in a day or two days. But sometimes, when it gets busy, it can be two weeks. And then, you know, it's not always, it's not, the fast is open until June 30th, but really, like, the sooner you get it done, the better, because a lot, as we'll mention, there's a lot of aid that you might miss out on possibly if you don't get it done earlier, because some of it is a limited pool of money that goes away as soon as it's gone. So sometimes it's first come, first serve type, type thing. Right. Um, just to add to what Jeff was saying about the PIN, or to <laughs> reinforce, that PIN number that you get, again, there's two PIN numbers, one for the student and one for the responsible parent who's going to be attached to this child's financial aid until they're age 24. So this PIN number is just as important as a social or their, their uh, birth certificate. You want to keep it in the same file. Do not lose your PIN. It is a nightmare. It becomes attached to your social security number, and if you lose it, it's just like a ton of paperwork. So keep, keep your PINs. You need them until they graduate from graduate school or they turn 24. <laughs> which is, yeah, whichever. Whichever happens first. Uh, so... What we thought we'd do is go through a real financial aid offer with you. So again, before we looked at Merced back in 2010, their cost of attendance was 29002 And um, this is an actual financial aid offer from one of my students um, and from a local family whose family forms just around 45000 a year, pretty typical here. Um, and so you can get a sense of how financial aid actually works out for locals. So the first thing on that um, financial aid offer is something called Campus Work Study. Campus Work Study is a federal program, generally speaking. And so the thing that I want to bring up here, um, also about PIN numbers in the FAFSA, is we have this other financial aid system in California called the California Dream Act. And so if you're California Dream Act eligible and you don't have a social, first thing, you don't need a PIN either, which is kind of nice. Um, and second thing, when you look at these financial aid offers, anything that says federal, California Dreamers are not eligible to receive because that's from the U.S. government. The U.S. government has not bought on to Dream Act yet. Um, so, as we go through this, campus work study is typically a federal program. Some schools in California have taken it out of other funds so that it's not federal. So you have to know which school you're attending and whether or not it's federal. But let's assume this is federal. So could Dreamers get this? Dream Act students? No, right? Because it's U.S. government money. Um, and work study is a great program. It's a guaranteed job on campus. Guaranteed job. No interview. You just show up, pick a job from the list, and you've got a job that will pay exactly that much. Okay, so that's a pretty good deal. Um, the next one is a federal direct subsidized loan. And I don't want to get into subsidized <laughs> versus unsubsidized here, but nonetheless, the two important words there are federal. So can dreamers get it? No. Okay, and loan. Loan, is that a debt or is it free money that you're going to keep? No. Seniors. <laughs> loan or free money you're going to keep? Debt. Yeah, it's a debt. Okay, so a loan is a debt. Um, 
And uh, the next one is also a federal loan. And Parents, if your kid blows it, whose debt does it become? Yours. <laughs> so just be aware. You know, you guys, you guys, like, it's a joint agreement when you guys sign those master promissory notes. You're both signing them. So if they default, it usually ends up on you. So have that discussion of let's plan our money wisely and, and, and set up a budget and not blow our t you know two thousand dollars on a brand new MacBook and all the stuff that we don't necessarily need possibly, um, but just you know being budget friendly. I kind of want to talk just briefly about the unsubsidized and subsidized because I think that's an important thing for you guys to know when we're looking at some of these things. Um, anybody, who doesn't know what that means? Okay, good. Uh, so so when we're talking unsubsidized, both of those are are referring to loans. Okay, unsubsidized means that when you take this loan out, it comes with an interest rate. Okay, so usually, if, I think it's like 5 point something cent percent right now, is it 4? Uh, 6 point, I don't know. I forget. Uh, it's, it's somewhere between the 5s and 6s. It varies by year to year usually. Um, and I think they just actually dropped it back down to July. Um, but it's, yes, perfect, using your resources, I love it. Uh, but when I'm talking about unsubsidized loans, when you take that loan out your first year of college and you take a $5,000 unsubsidized loan, you get $5,000, but that interest starts accruing now. Meaning that as soon as you step foot on campus that first day, that interest starts to grow on that $5,000. So that's unsubsidized. Subsidized is the opposite. So subsidized means that when you take that $5,000 out, as long as you are a full-time student, based on the state's requirement, or, or the federal, which is usually about 12 units, um, you act, that, that interest is still accruing, but it's paid by the government. Okay? So the government actually pays your interest until you graduate, and then for about nine months afterwards. Six months? Okay. A short period afterwards to give you a chance to find a job. Okay. After that, your interest kicks in. It's not like it jumps up. It doesn't add all the interest at the end, but it just it does start kicking in when the repayment happens. Um, one personal nice thing about the subsidized loans that I can tell you from experience is my wife has excellent credit because she had a bunch of subsidized loans. That subsidized loan, every time that interest gets paid by the government, not by you, by the government, it gets reported to the credit unions. And so when she graduated college, she had super credit, which helps when you're looking at apartments, when you're looking at things like credit cards and buying a car, all that kind of stuff. So that's one benefit of a loan. So, so I don't think we want to scare you away from loans, but I think it's a smart thing to be informed about loans. Because sometimes loans can be very helpful if, if we want to go achieve a certain goal, but if we don't approach it strategically, they can quickly become overbearing. Any questions about unsubsidized, subsidized? Yes. It's a good question. So, so yes and no. So you will get a financial aid package, which usually looks a lot like this, um, and they'll say, okay, we are going to give you $3,500 of a subsidized loan and $2,000 of that loan. Say, you know, say you you get down to your end of your financial aid package, you go five, you you, you got to find some way to get five thousand dollars, right? Without you know, without any loans. If you take your subsidized loan of thirty five hundred dollars, you still got fifteen hundred dollars to find somewhere. You have a choice of okay, I'm going to take an uns unsubsidized loan or not. So, so your package, you don't have to accept every part of your package. You get to choose. So you might choose, I'm going to take the subsidized loan, but instead of taking the unsubsidized loan, I'm going to take some money out of my savings for this, my summer job that I worked, you know, my car fund or whatever, and kick it towards my tuition. So I don't have to take that unsubsidized loan out. I can offset that cost with other money, but you can still choose to take, or you can take $1,000 of the $2,000. Does that make sense to answer your question? Is the real difference whether you have financial aid or not? The subsidized, you have to have financial need, and unsubsidized, you don't need financial need. Yes. 
Yes. But they're both the same interest rate is what I said. Yes. The interest is deferred versus... Yes. So, so the interest is deferred on a subsidized, but not on the other one. But they are the same rate, usually. Um, and you'll get a lot of different lenders, people like that. But essentially, when you see federal, it's coming from the U.S. government. They have a bunch of people that service their loans, is what they call them. But it's all coming from the same pool of money with the same rules and all that stuff. Yeah, and the other thing about that interest rate is it is a fixed rate. It is not like those scary ballooning mortgages some of us saw. And um, it's not like any of those scary other loans you hear about. This is possibly the easiest, most simple, straightforward loan on the planet. No special hidden things, you can pay them off early, no penalties, they're easy. Um, so it's a good way to start your credit. Uh, let's see, so moving right along, if we go down to federal Pell Grant, federal, can dreamers get it? No? Okay, um, Pell, we don't care what that means, it's a guy's name. Grant, <laughs> grant means money you keep, you keep, no interest, no pay, it back, it's yours, okay? So that's pretty exciting. And then, who knows who the Bobcats are? Who are the Bobcats? The school's mascot. Yeah, Merced is the Bobcats. So the Bobcat grant is a state grant from UC Merced. So, can Dreamers get that? Yes, right. So this is the big thing the Dream Act was about. The schools can now give the students that they have admitted and that they want, because they admitted them, some money. Um, it reduces the cost of attendance in California by about 50%, which is very significant. Um, so that's good to know. If you have a neighbor who's in this situation, tell them about this. Um, okay, so our total amount of aid, and I'm going to take a pause here and say, okay, so parents in the audience nod with me. Are you getting that no one else on the planet is going to give your 17 or 18 year old $5,500 of loans? No one but the government will do this, right? It is aid. And often I'll get parents saying, oh, but it's a loan, they have to pay it back. Well, well, yes, but the truth of the matter is there's not a bank on the planet that would make this loan. Um, anyone know why the federal government is interested in investing in your student's education? <laughs> yeah. You might. <laughs> you might. Um, it's because, uh, let's see, in California, I think the most recent number is for every dollar the state invests in higher education, they expect to get four dollars back in tax revenue. <laughs> so it's a good investment, right? But only if you're a government. So banks will not make these loans to your children, only schools will. Um, they do it through the federal government. So uh, if you take that scary number, 9,002 and subtract the total aid package, how much do you come up with? Anyone? All right, yeah, a little over 3,000. Yeah, 3,000 ish. We'll just round for now. Who can afford to go to college for 3,000? Everyone, right? You can save this over the summer working at the putt putt course, right? Uh, <laughs> working at the beach, right? So, you know, even if you don't feel like you have a lot of money, once you go through the financial aid process, you will get a financial aid package. And, you know, if you're in this family's income range, it'll look something like this. So, where, where are we now? I'm so confused by using the slide thing. Uh, okay, so here is the remaining need thing. Um, again, how can the family reduce this number, the 3,162 left over? Um, one way is by the students putting some work in and getting some scholarships, right? Scholarships will first go to pay this, this off. Then, if they were, say, to get 5000 that extra 2000 you could use to pay down that loan offer, right? So you'd take on less loans. So the more scholarships you get students, the less debt you have when you leave campus, right? Makes life easier. Um, Let's see, grants, you're unlikely to get grants at this age, <laughs> except through your financial aid process. Um, adding cash from your savings is a great way to pay that last little bit, right? Um, and this is where I just wanted to mention um, the difference between private schools and public schools comes up. Because in a public school, in California anyway, they're mandated to try and meet your need, which is something we'll discuss what that means in a second. But what it means is they're going to try and keep your out-of-pocket expenses down to a reasonable amount for your income, okay? Whereas a private school doesn't necessarily have that mandate. 
So this is where you start to hear those stories about people going into tons of debt. The reality is, is that the federal government is never going to loan your freshman student more than $5,500. That's not a lot of debt. That's a reasonable amount of debt, right? Um, but how people get into trouble is if they are looking at a private school and that last remainder is more like 20000 and then they decide to take out a private loan to pay the additional expense, that's how you get into those big debts. Generally speaking, if you stick with the public school system, it's hard to accrue more than about 20, what is, what's the number, 24,000 over five years in school. It's just hard to do um, because the federal loan limits are low. <laughs> so, so that's just a thought on that. Um, moving along. Okay, so how do we calculate need? Um, what the FAFSA really is, is it's an application not for aid, but for an evaluation of your financial status. What it produces is a number that's called your EFC, which is up there in the slide, which stands for Expected Family Contribution. And this is where it always gets complicated and I expect to see hands going up. Um, so basically, in the most simple sense, the FAFSA is based on your adjusted gross income. And parents who filled out their taxes know that's one of the lines on the bottom of the first page which is basically all the income, all the taxable income you've gotten for the year. Okay, so, you know, it's whatever that is. And it's on your household income. So, depending on your household income, the government does some fancy shenanigans and they come up with an EFC for your household based on that AGI, basically. Um, there's other factors, but that's the most simplistic form. That EFC is really what the government thinks, based on your tax return, you can afford to pay each year for college. Okay, so the question that often comes up now is, do we have to do this every year? And the answer is yes. <laughs> you get to file a FAFSA every year, which is why it's so important to keep your PIN number, because you want that PIN number around, because you have to do this every January. Okay, <laughs> so, uh, I think you want to jump in with it. No? Okay. Yeah, here's where it gets tricky. So, okay, so um, if you take a look at that handout um, that has Chico on it. Oh. Yeah, I didn't get that. Oh, yes, I did. Look at that. Du -du 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 -du. Chico, Chico. Um, this is another local family. Uh, if you want to start at the top with me, that top box is called what? Do you guys remember? cost of attendance, right? So if you Google cost of attendance, this is what would have come up for Chico back in 2010-11. Um, total cost was 23,190. We all know that you can reduce that, right, by being smart, right? Cutting down that meal plan, living in a triple, right? buying used books, right? All those things help. Okay, but you know, the cost, the estimated cost is 23,190. Um, this was a lower income family of five um, whose AGI, was 25,000 a year. Okay. Um, so, when they filed their FAFSA, this family actually got back an EFC of about a thousand bucks. Okay, so their EFC was a thousand. So, kind of make a mental note or write that down. EFC equals a thousand. Okay. So, when a college uh, receives your financial information or your EFC from the FAFSA, because part of the FAFSA is putting in the colleges that you apply to so that they can send them this information about you, right? So they're going to send that EFC to the schools you apply to. The schools are going to start calculating your financial aid. And it's going to be based on the EFC. So what they're really doing is they take that total number, the 23,190, they subtract your expected family contribution, and that remainder, and this is important, this is called your financial need. And yes, that's a technical government term. <laughs> financial need. So cost of attendance minus your EFC is your financial need. Why do you care? Okay, so if you want to use your friend Google, you can Google the percent of need met by most colleges. Oh yes, you can. So it was also on your Navient's Family Connection account for each of those colleges. You can find a lot of this information on their students. <laughs> right, and parents, because this is complicated, right? So, um, so you can figure out what your need is, right? 
And then uh, for each college, using your ESC, and in the single handout, there is a, on the, this, this side, on the what, the FAFSA side, um, there's a link down there to a free calculator. It doesn't require any personal information. And you can do a quick calculation of your EFC that way. So you can start to get a sense of how much money you're going to need to put aside for college each year. Pretty good, huh? You can do this. You can also abuse Jeff and me <laughs> for this help. So, so that's how they calculate it. So for this, that if we go back to the example up on the board, this this family's, um, oh, I got it wrong, the, the EFC was, or, I lied, 2,554, and um, the difference between the remaining need and the family's EFC was 1,000 bucks, okay? And the trend we've seen in California when I started in this business, it used to be about 100 bucks, and then it was 500 bucks, and now it's really around 2,000 bucks. Um, so it's your EFC plus or minus 2,000 is what you want to put aside. <laughs> to attend college comfortably. Okay. Uh, let's see. Moving right along. Anyone bored to tears yet? Are we bored to tears? It's kind of boring. I know. Okay. You guys aren't asking a lot of questions, so I'm concerned. Okay. All right. Um, okay, so how do you figure out what you can afford? By knowing your EFC. So use that quick calculator, figure out what your EFC is. Um, and again, it's what the government thinks you can afford. Okay, and they expect you to stretch a little. It's not like they think, oh, they can just spend this and they won't notice, right? They know it's going to hurt a little bit, but um, they want you to plan and save or take on a part-time job or something, uh, whatever it is. Okay, so um, just because this is interesting data, these are a bunch of EFCs for locals. <laughs> that I've worked with. And as a classic in Tahoe, we have a lot of people on one end and a lot of people on the other end. Um, but there's pretty much no one in the middle in Tahoe. I don't know, you know, that's just, we just don't attract anyone in the middle. Um, but uh, the EFCs here on the left side were down around 1,000, under 5,000. That red spot is the example we were using with UC Merced. Um, and then you go up to the other end where we have people whose EFCs are 99999. Nine, one more nine in there. Um, so that they're never going to get any assistance from the state or federal government, but they might get assistance from the private schools. Um, and they might get assistance from each school's independent donors. So there's, there's opportunities there still. All right, so calculate your EFC at home. Go to college and uh, go from there. So we'll take quick. Actually, let's go down. Let's go to the next slide first. Yep. I want you guys to write this down. Okay. So January fourteenth. It's a Tuesday. And this is just the first one of these. This is kind of the big, the big one. Okay. So so this is kind of a, like I said, a general overview of financial aid in a whole. Okay. If we were to talk about filling out your FAFSA tonight, it would probably take us like three hours. It, it's it's not. It's kind of like filling your taxes. There's take box one and put it in box three, and, and, and it's all online, so, so a lot of it's like doing your taxes online. Um, but there's a lot of really specific questions that go along with it. Uh, so, so instead of doing that, we, we went over a general over financial aid, and I will talk for a little bit about scholarships specific to us, um, and a few other things locally here in just a second. But um, I wanted you guys to write this down. So January 14th, 4.30 to 6 p.m., we will have drop-in hours for what's called File Your FAFs tonight. This will be in the library. I will be here. Emily will be here. We will also have two representatives from Sierra Nevada College over at Incline who work in the financial aid office to come and help us make sure that you guys have all the support you need. Because they can add, you know, it's one thing for us to say, oh, yeah, this is how you fill it out. This is what you can get back. But it's another thing to hear it from the people that actually evaluate these forms and say, this is what we do. Or like they might have some extra tricks up their sleeve from working on the opposite side of the spectrum that they can offer you to say, hey, instead of doing this, like what if you, what if you did this? And they're not going to break any laws, but sometimes there's ways around finances. Uh, and I do just want to highlight too that sometimes financial aid is is if you have a very individual, 
highly complicated, you know, you have three houses, a boat, you're getting divorced, and you own your own business, all that kind of stuff. Like a lot of these really complicated kind of, if, if you use a tax consultant, it might be a good idea to get a fin like a financial aid advisor. That's not me. I, so I don't know that intricate of details about the financial aid process and the finances behind it. There are a lot of tricks and tools and ways to move around your 401k to this other thing or an annuity to this or that that can help you lower this expected family contribution number. Okay, and there are a lot of people that make their living helping people do that. And, you know, there are people locally that I can definitely refer you to. Emily can probably refer you to. If you're in that situation, I highly suggest, I mean, it's, it's probably going to cost you 1500 bucks, 2000 bucks to talk to this person. But typically, if you're in that situation, it's going to save you four times that much. So it's well worth talking to people in most cases. And, they, and most, pe most people that I, I would refer you to are not people that would cheat you out of your money. They will say, yes, I can definitely give you save you some money. And here's probably a good estimate of how much money you can save you if you listen to what I have to tell you. And so they're not going to steal your money. They're going to help. You're going to save money in the long run by paying a little bit up front. So that's my suggestion as your school counselor is that if you have that situation, use some of the resources locally. That's what they're there for and that's their expert in their business. Okay. Let me, if you don't mind, I'm going to jump in and talk about some of the most common fit pitfalls that people encounter in this process. Um, the first is this. We're suggesting that you file your FAFSA in the beginning of January. Ideally, the first two weeks is, is fantastic. You get an A+, plus, we'll call it that. Um, if you file your FAFSA after March 2nd, you lose all of your aid from California. Okay, so there's this window, January 1st to March 2nd, where you really, really should do your best to file your FAFSA. Now, those of you who are taxpayers are thinking, but I'm not going to have my taxes done by then, right? When are your taxes due? April 15th, right? After this window. So the most common mistake I have is parents call me, I don't know, March 15th and say, so I'm getting my taxes done, you know, when should I file my FAFSA? And it's too late, they've lost all their California aid. Okay, so what you want to do is you're, I think I'm going to answer it probably. You're going to file your FAFSA in January based on your 2012 return. And there's a box in there that says, I'm filing based on an estimate. You check the box and you're good to go. Use your 2012 return. You just pull, you know, it says go to line 34 and you put line 34's answer in your FAFSA. It's that easy. So you just go through and you do that and then you hit submit. Hitting submit puts you in the queue and says that you turned it in on time on that date. Then, once you filed your taxes, you go back in for 2013 and you update your FAFSA. But that happens later, it doesn't matter when it happens, okay, that's a lie, you want to do it as soon as you can. Um, <laughs> you don't want to wait till April 15th because if you wait, the schools you're applying to aren't going to get your actual information. Right? You're making the schools wait to give you a financial aid offer. So you want to get your taxes done as soon as possible, but really file your FAFSA before you even start thinking about your taxes for 2013. Yes, ma'am? Um, you said like between like January 1st and March 2nd, like if you apply after March 2nd, you lose what you get from California? Yes, you lose, lose your Cal Grant. Every state has their own deadline, but um, if you're going out of state, your California aid won't come with you anyway, so it doesn't matter. So yeah. kind of and you probably wouldn't qualify for any state grant your, your aid that you're going into either. So, so you would you you may possibly miss out on some school deadlines, which might cut you out of some school aid that they might offer you right. if you if you don't make and it, as I usually my mantra: deadlines matter. This is this is really important. Like. Deadline, you, you miss that March 3rd, you're out. Like, there's no going back. You know, it makes sense to meet your deadlines. So just make sure that you do it early. Just do that. Was there a question back there? Yes, I question. Okay, good. So, um, another pitfall, and I mentioned this because it's the holiday season, um, 
let's say grandma and grandpa know that your fabulous son or daughter is going to college and they decide to write them a check for Christmas, okay, do not put that check in your account until after you file your FAFSA. It will count as income, okay? Neither the student should put it in their account, nor should the parent. You want to hang on to that until after you file your FAFSA. Yes, ma'am. I think that uh, the, the, the ceiling on the student account is somewhere around $6,000 right now, so if the student has over $6,000 in their account, it starts to count against them. But up to $6,000, it doesn't really affect the FAFSA. Yeah, does that answer? What if you withdraw all your money and put it under your mattress? That's a brilliant plan. A little sketchy, but brilliant, actually. Yeah. I mean, if you have to report what's your big account, it's not it's there. I'm just saying. Yeah, and, and Jeff is making the point, in a funny way, um, that the FAFSA asks you to put the information in for the day you are filing it. So yeah, I have seen people do things like that. You take all your money out for the day. I'm not condoning or saying that's a good thing, but I have seen it happen. Um, but yeah, particularly the check from grandma, that's always one that sneaks by people. <laughs> so. One thing that's nice too about the FAFSA guys, since it's all online, they also have a tool that actually connects to the IRS that you can connect. It, it pulls all of your data over. So, so it literally migrates information straight from your tax filing into the FAFSA. So there's hardly even any entering needed. It's, it's adding a few boxes here and there, and then it's automatically entered for you straight from your tax return. Yes? Let's say I had a grandma who wanted to get this money. I wish I did. But, uh, <laughs> I would tend to agree with you, but of course, you know, personal finance is up to the individual. Um, something I often recommend is that grandma hangs on to that money until the kid is done with school, and one day after they graduate, they pay off the loans. Put it to a, to a CD yeah. and get some interest on it, and then pay you know pay down your loans, invest it, get eight percent back. Right. I mean, there, there's ways that you can let it sit. I mean, eight percent is bigger than. I mean, your average market return it obviously you know, sways back and forth, but you know, on average, there's a market return of about 8%. And I mean, that's 2% more than your, your loan, your interest rate. So I mean, yeah. save it, and, and if you need it, use it. But yeah, it, does, it would count against you. Yeah. Any other major pitfalls we can think of right now? <laughs> Not following directions. So there, you know, just like your college applications, there are very specific guidelines and directions and things that they're asking for. And if you do not complete the fast, so a lot, of, you know, sometimes people will, will think that they finished it, they didn't, they didn't follow the rule or the direction at the very end, and, and it never actually got submitted to the federal government. Okay, so it's very important. If there's a box of like three paragraphs of text, read that box by filling out the fast. So you're agreeing to all that stuff. Don't let it come back and bite you in the end. Just read through it. You know, it's worth spending the time. Most people, in my experience, fill out the FAFSA. So it takes an hour, maybe. Um, and if you come on the 14th or some of the other, other dates, we will have a few in the morning for some people that might work at night. And I will do one at lunchtime as well. Um, so I'll have like an hour and a half lunchtime opportunity for people just to come in and get some help. Um, that you guys can, you can start the FAFSA, complete it, submit it while you're at school, and go home and say I'm done. You can. You, you need to set up an appointment with me to do that. Um, the reason why the 14th might be nice is because other really smart people might be along with me that might, might have insight into other situations that I don't know about. Um, you know, Emily's pretty, pretty knowledgeable about it. Those financial aid people will be like Jedi's. They'll like, you should do this and get it done. So, so that would be a very beneficial thing for that reason. And a great way to help Jeff out is to start filing your FAFSA, but don't hit submit, so that everything's in there and he can just kind of look through it with you and, and make sure nothing blaringly awful is going on. Um, 
make updates to it rather than having him read through every single question with you. You, you guys can do this. When you, it, the FAFSA is set up to be pretty easy nowadays. It used to be a big nightmare in the last four years. It's gotten a lot easier. If you just click in the box that you're supposed to fill in, a little help note comes up and tells you what number to refer to on your tax form. You know, it's just point and shoot. So There's also, I don't know if it's 24-7, but it's a long time. Yeah. They have live support that you can chat with as you're filling it out. You can pick up the phone and call them. Yeah that are trained to help you work through the process, that is gonna be a lifesaver for a lot of you guys. You have no idea, okay, I have three boxes, I think this is the number supposed to come from, I don't know which one I'm supposed to use. Call the phone in two minutes or less, probably you have someone on there that will direct you to the right place. Um, and so it's really easy to get some help on it. Um, don't go to fafsa.com. So that's wrong. That's that's a there. Are, you have to be very careful with financial aid, with scholarships, and all that stuff. There are a lot of people out there that try to prey on people who are one either uninformed, two not technologically savvy, or three in a hurry. That they want your personal information, which you you, you fill out your social security number, you fill out all of your financial aid, all your financials in this form. The government form is very secure. It's all locked up and. To safe and tight. If you go to this other form, you're basically handing them your social security card, your bank account information, all of this stuff. And so just be very wary of where you're going. So you're going again, fafsa.ed.gov for government is the correct one. Anything that's calm is commercial, right? So I'll talk a little bit about scholarships. So how do we lower this, uh, this kind of section of money that we need to find out how to get that. Some people have a much bigger section than others. Um, and, you know, last year we gave almost $400,000 away in scholarships. Um, and so every year is a little bit different. There's a few big ones that definitely boost that number um, each year, depending on where it goes. Um, and so there are a few things that I like to mention when I'm talking about scholarships. There's a couple different categories of scholarships, okay? The first category I'd like to mention and kind of steer people away from, it's not a bad thing, but it's not necessarily a good return for your time and your information, is, is what I call the sweepstakes scholarships. Those are your big Dr. Pepper, Coca-Cola, like national scholarships that you hear about. That's kind of like winning that big $560 million lottery. The likelihood of you, I mean, it's literally a sweepstakes. You, there's usually no essay required, there's no, you just type in your name, your email address, and submit in most cases. And yeah, somebody wins that every year, but the likelihood of it being you is small. Okay, so I, I'm not saying don't do it, but just evaluate the time you're spending on it, and if it's a wise use of your time. You will probably get junk mail from those things as well, so just be prepared. Um, the second level of scholarships, so that's the big national ones. The second level of scholarships is kind of our state or regional scholarships. Those are things like, uh, we have a few of them posted in the office right now. Things like our Sacramento, um, some of the Bay Area type scholarships. We'll get notifications about those. You can find ones like those online um, if you search. Um, and those are much more useful for your time. Regional ones are typically a little bigger. The reward is a little bit higher. Uh, they will have a lot more applicants than, uh, than things like our local scholarships. So instead of a, you know, a couple million for the national ones, they'll probably have 20,000 maybe scholarship applicants, and they have to pick from those. Um, a lot of those will require things like essays, um, community service requirements, all that stuff. The next level below that is kind of our, our local scholarships. Okay. Our local scholarships are things like the Tahoe Truckee Community Foundation, the Tahoe Truckee Community Scholarship Corporate or Foundation. I don't know why they named them like that, but it makes things really confusing for everybody that has to do them. But those are two people that are kind of a conglomerate of scholarships. They provide one application that goes out to 80 this year, 80 scholarships. So by filling out one of those things, you may not qualify for all 80 of them based on your gender or what school you're going to and all that stuff, but you get entered into the scholarships that you qualify for by filling out that application. Um, 
I don't have an exact date of when the application is going to be handed to me. I will make sure that you know the second I get it. Um, and I will probably hand every single senior both of those in their own personal little hands. Yes? Yes. So there will be a link on the website. And FYI, our website will be changing in January, I believe. We're getting, the whole district is getting a new website. So don't be surprised when you show up to North Tyler High School website and it's totally different and things might not be where you expect them. Um, for you students, all of these scholarships that I get will also be posted on your Noggin Family Connection account under the scholarships link. So you will have access to a lot of information about what they are, uh, some of the requirements for them, as well as usually a link to either the website that has a scholarship application on it or the actual PDF or Word document to the scholarship that you can start filling out. 99% of the scholarships that you'll find are electronic. Um, surprisingly, our two local ones are not. Um, you have to actually fill them out on paper. I'm trying to kick them in the butt and get them in the 21st century, which they're moving in the right direction, but it's not there yet. Okay, so there will be paper applications that you guys will need to fill out. Um, do some community service hours between now and like February. That way you can mark a whole bunch of them down. That's a big hint. Um, but there, is, the one thing that I will say about our, our local scholarships are excellent. They give away a lot of money. Um, the average award is about $2,000. Uh, some of them are higher. There's a few things like the Vail Scholarship that's higher, that's like $10,000. Um, but there's only a couple of those. There's a few $5,000 ones, a couple $750 ones. But there's people that walked out of there with you know, yeah, ten thousand, twenty thousand dollars last year in their pocket, ready to go to school, and that doesn't have to be spent all their first year. Uh, the one thing I will say about those scholarships is, uh, as soon as I find it in my brain, or where it went. I interrupt. Yes. I interrupt. Well, I okay. First thing, this young lady in front had a question. Did we answer it? It's generally April 15th is what they shoot for. Now, I'm going to run I'm gonna e whatever. I'm going to email them and see if they get... I thought I remember hearing a date that I looked for it. I couldn't find anything that had a specific date. So instead of telling you a date and being wrong, I just won't tell you. Um, they're usually but I will, I will email them and see if they did say a date that they had said we will get the same hand by then. Um, and then but I will let you guys know. Typically, it's April 15th to May 15th. Unless their committee can't get together for snow. I remember. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, so, wait, so, can I jump? When I'm yes, no, forget. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. sorry, we're going to show the floor. Um, so, this timing thing on that scholarship, um, maybe you will help me and join my personal campaign to get them to do this earlier. Um, because that is what I was going to say. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So, um, here's the thing the FAFSA, you do that in January, ideally, it gets done, it goes to the schools. The schools send out your financial aid awards. If you're lucky, late March, okay, then generally in April. When do you have to choose which college you're going to? Anyone know? Uh, May 1st. Yeah, May 1st. It's a national deadline. Every college on the planet needs to hear from you whether or not you're going or not going, and whether or not they're giving you their financial aid, right? By May 1st. With a deposit, usually. Yeah, with a deposit or two. And uh, the, the issue that I keep trying to get to our community scholarship, bless their hearts because they're doing a great job, um, is that a lot of our lower income students are making decisions without that money. And then they get the money later and they've already chosen the college that cost less because it cost less. Yes, so, so the, the help scholarships. Us, help us tell this heartbreaking tale. Get them. <laughs> to get them to it's do it. It's very earlier. exciting, <laughs> but yeah. it's not super helpful because at senior award tonight, that is when the scholarships are announced. Yeah. You don't know whether or not you're getting money from these scholarships until usually like the week before graduation. So it's super fun, makes for a fun evening, not super helpful when we're picking colleges. Right. Um, and the other thing I wanted to say about dates is May 1st has another significant um, thing to help spread around the community. May 1st is the first day that you can register for fall semester at community colleges. Okay, so when you hear someone saying, you know, I'm going to community college is cheaper, okay, this would be younger students, tell them, go through the whole process, because there's a lot of money out there, in, just in the process, right? And you won't know how much you're going to get until May 1st. 
right? You're not going to have all those financial aid offers really until mid-April, right? And then you'll know whether or not you can afford it, and you still have time to choose on May 1st to go to the community college if that's the right path for you. Question, yeah. Mainly because you want to be able to put it on your community foundation scholarships. If you do it after that, you're not going to be able to count it. Now, are, they, are they looking at throughout your high school career? Yeah. Uh, throughout your high school career, usually. So, so, but I mean, if you've done 40 hours between now and February, that looks great. Obviously, it would look great if, greater if you did 40 hours every year, but 40 hours is better than no hours. Uh, the last section that I will cover is is school-based scholarships. So, so your school most likely has its own scholarship application uh, that's either separate from their application or it is part of the FAFSA. So, so they do it a couple different ways. They do they pull information straight from the FAFSA. They automatically consider you for scholarships based on that money, which kind of essentially is part of your financial aid package. You can, it's, it's very similar, you usually get notification at a very similar time period of, oh, you were considered, you got the scholarship at a, at a same time for most schools. There's also ones where you actually have to look, go to the website, go to the different departmental websites and see about their scholarships. Sometimes they'll have applications for specific scholarships, other times they'll have one application for all scholarships, for, for that department or that whole school or the entire college. Okay. That is very important because you don't want to miss those deadlines. So, as you're just like when you're looking at the admissions information on the school's website to find out information about deadlines, what stuff you need to do, hop over now, go from the admissions department to the financial aid department. There's also another tab, probably right next to the admissions tab, that says financial aid. It's it's financial aid season, so now it's time to move over and live in that tab for a little while until we have to go back to the admissions tab and say yes we want to come here and, and you may still you may get five different offers from schools with admissions acceptance you have decisions to make and hopefully because hopefully i, I guided you all in a great direction that you guys pick schools and apply to schools that you would be happy with every single one of them you don't want to have to choose between a school that you absolutely are in love with that you can't really afford with a school that you apply to because you thought you could afford it and don't actually want to go there. So hopefully when you apply, you apply to schools that you'd be happy with all of them. That way you can really shop around. And I suggest creating a spreadsheet or a little piece of paper with the breakdowns of the schools and how much that extra money you're going to have to do, what kind of financial aid package, shop around. Uh, there's ways that you can compare notes and see, okay, is the benefit of going to this school worth the extra $8,000 I might have to pay? Or is it better to go here, save some money, get a great education, and still be super happy? So there, just because you've been admitted, there's still decision-making and shopping that has to happen. And that usually happens after you get your financial aid package back. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't go out and buy your one shirt quite yet, your, your sweatshirt, you know, the Harvard sweatshirt, and wear it to school and walk around and be all happy and proud. Because your decision is not made yet. And your decision, the, the college's decision is not made yet either. They have until June 12th or 11th or whatever this year is, graduation day. 10th? How many days left? <laughs> um, they have until that deadline, that day, to say, oh, guess what? We gave you admittance based on your grades. We got your last transcript. Your grades suck spring semester. We change our mind. We're choosing this person and not you. They can totally do that. And it's a scary thing, but if you're, if you're going forward and doing well, not a scary thing. If you have a big, like, senioritis in the spring of junior year, that's usually not a good thing. So be excited, but like, don't go sell the farm because you're deciding you're going to Harvard or wherever these schools are. Just keep in mind that it, it's still up in, up in the air somewhat. Does that make sense? I don't want to scare you, but don't just like put all that eggs in one basket because you got the admissions notice, which is always provisional. 
wonderful. I call it the senioritis myth. Do not have senioritis. Because <laughs> if you have senioritis, you're going to get a C or two, or maybe even a D, and then you're not going to be admitted to the place you thought you were going. So don't do that. Um, the other thing, I just wanted to save you some time on what Jeff was talking about with the institutional aid or the scholarships that come from the colleges you've applied to. UCs incorporate all the scholarship information into their web, into their application. So you don't have to do that for any UC. They've made that a standard across the system. CSUs, yes, every single campus has their own scholarship policy. So if you've applied to a CSU, you want to research. And of course, any out-of-state or private school, they all have their own policies. But uh, my favorite example is um, San Jose State has a scholarship that's only found in the engineering website. Engineering College has its own website. Yeah, 25000 a year, a computer, a smartphone, and an internship at HP every summer. You would know if you just filled out the college application. You would not know if you went to the financial aid website. You'd have to go to the engineering website to find it. So, yeah. so yeah, check out your department. That's what that to tell you. Question, yeah. They can, and every student is admitted conditionally. All admissions are conditional, and the conditions are spelled out in the admission letter, and they are all tied to your financial aid offer. Yeah, they all say, you know, if you get a D and you don't tell us, or if you get a D and we decide we don't want you anymore, we can rescind your offers. And they can, they, so when you, say for example, you submit your taxes for the last year that we haven't filed yet, you might, and you haven't, didn't update it right away, you might get an estimate, right? It might, or am I totally off base? Where they, you will get, oh, here's your financial aid package based on 2012. You update your FAFSA, it might change based on this year's. Is yeah. that correct? Yeah, Jeff is correct. Some private schools can still do that. Um, more, uh, more schools in the last two years have decided that you must update your FAFSA before they will create a financial aid offer. So it is important, parents, to get your taxes done the second you get those W-2s and get that update in. And as Jeff was saying, do it electronically because that will save a lot of time, too, for the update. So once you filed your taxes electronically, it's literally like two clicks. All that information goes into the FAFSA and you are updated and done. If you do it on paper, it takes forever. And then the processing time is six to eight weeks. Yeah, so let's say you waited until April 15th, and you did your update then. April 15th, right? Then you get your taxes back, what, two weeks later? That's May 1st. You have no information about money with which to make a decision, right? Don't be that person, <laughs> okay? We'll help you, but don't be that person. It's not fun. Other than that, that I mean, that's the big issue. That's the big stuff about scholarships it is I mean we have so I guess I'll, I'll, where do we find these scholarships okay that's a good question um, those big national ones you can I mean there's things like fast web there's a search tool on Naviance that you can search for scholarships but again you're gonna find mostly those big national ones the sweepstakes you'll find a few regional ones you won't find any local ones pretty much that they're very few and far between and they usually don't make it out into the big scholarship world um, so, so it's kind of like you can find a lot of sweepstakes, but the likelihood, like it's an X, the likelihood of getting them is really small. You can find a few local ones, but the likelihood of getting them is much higher. Uh, in terms of like our regional local ones, I get some mailed to me or emailed to me or handed to me by, by parents. If you guys get information, don't be selfish and <laughs> keep it to yourself. Share it with me. Um, that's just my suggestion. You can deal with your own morals, but if I would suggest sharing, because I think other parents are doing the same thing. So you know, let other people have an opportunity to. Um, but I love when parents hand me, "Oh, did you hear about the scholarship?" No, I didn't. Great. Let me make some copies. I'll post it on the website. I'll add it to my to my wall. So yeah. So there's a few way, a few different kind of areas that you can access some of these scholarships. One of them. Definitely the World Wide Web search for them. The second one is through your Naviance Family Connection account. I will post any one. It might take me a day or two um, once I receive them to get up there. 
but I'll post them usually within a week of my receiving of them so they look online, so you can use that. There's, I will also, I also have a, a bulletin board in the office that I put a paper copy up. Students, do not steal my paper copy. Make a copy of my paper copy. Or else nobody else can make a copy of it. And I come back and there's no scholarships listed. Uh, the other way that I will probably do, but I'm going to start shying away from, is I do have a Google document that I try to keep updated um, that's listed on our website. I will be transitioning into, as we get more and more parents, it won't be for this year, so you guys listen up, but we will, if you have never students, we will be transitioning. I will be making more of an effort to put, keep those on their Valvance Family Connection account, less so in an area. Uh, so I'd have to update four or five different things every time I get a new one. Uh, make sure again, you're following those deadlines. Those deadlines are very important. I can't tell you, well, I could, probably nine students who your Community Scholarship Foundation is due at 2.30 on Friday, who called me at 3.30 on Friday and said, I'm in Sacramento. I need to turn in my application. Can you please stay until 5.30 to let me turn it in? Uh, yes. So, just be, just be on time. Okay. Sometimes there is, I mean, sometimes when, it, when it's like that situation, there's a little bit of leeway that I don't tell people about, but yes, we, there are sometimes exceptions that can be made. Other times, there are zero exceptions that can be made. Okay, a lot of times, especially with electronic stuff, it says it's due at 9 p.m. on Friday. That computer, if it's 9, or 9.01 in one second, that computer takes it offline. And you can be halfway through submitting it, you go to submit and say, oh, you missed the deadline, I'm sorry. And there's no way that they're going to go back and accept it. So just making sure you're getting those deadlines on time. Okay. Um, if you're looking at national ones, also be wary of the time zone. Just like with college applications, if you're applying to school on the East Coast, you might think, oh, I have until midnight on this day. And then you go in at 11 o'clock our time, guess what time it is on the East Coast? Past midnight. Same thing with scholarships. Be wary of where, if they say 9 p.m., just be, you know, maybe look up where this scholarship is located. They might say Connecticut. I would just assume 9 p.m. Eastern time and have it in by 6 p.m. our time. Like, just be safe. It's not worth it. Uh, most, some of them, sometimes you will have essays. Uh, read them two or three times. Have somebody else read them. I've had experience with a lot of students who will come to me and say, Mr. Reem, there's no scholarships. I say, what are you talking about? And they say, well, I looked at the board, I don't qualify for any scholarships. I say, did you read the scholarships? Well, no, I just read the name. Okay. Well, you know, I went down there, I found three of them, and I brought them back up to them and said, these are scholarships that you apply for that you qualify for, and they looked at me and said, oh, but I have to write an essay. <laughs> a 3,000 word essay. And they just looked at me like I was asking, and they said, okay, how long is it gonna take you to write a 3,000 page, you know, 3,000 3, page, 3,000 word essay? And that's, that's like extreme, usually it's about 500 to 1,000. I mean, that's a normal high school essay. How long does it take you guys to write an essay? A decent essay. Like 24 hours? Like how many, how many minutes? It's like three hours, maybe, right? Okay, I have a scholarship for $10,000. How much money are you making an hour? If you win this scholarship and it takes you three hours to write an essay. A lot. <laughs> Much more than you'll make, and most people ever will make in an hour. Okay, so when you're thinking about that, it's like, yeah, there's there's a chance that you won't get it, but if you do get that, that's three hours extremely well spent. You could work all summer and not make that much money, and it's half as much fun. Okay, so when you're thinking about it, don't think about necessarily the workload involved. Think about what you're going to get out of it and how your time is going to be spent. You know, if you're trying to debate, do I turn in my senior English paper and do a really good job on that, or do I turn in my scholarship essay? 
do your senior paper English. Because you can, you can have... <laughs> see, see that, that's why I'm saying that. Because you, you can spend all this time on your scholarship essay. You fail English, you're not in college. You're out of college and that scholarship goes right back to the foundation. Okay, so really, I mean, your grades are still your number one priority. I can't say that enough. Your grades are the highest thing that you can experience right now. That will make the biggest difference, believe it or not, in your scholarships too. You will get the most grades if you are a good student. Calvary's and you will get... are based on your grade point average. Yeah, and on the high end of the Calvary, you can get up to like $12,000. And on the low end, you can get like one or two. So, get good grades and get the twelve. So, so I won't, I won't preach that anymore, but just know, it's very important, you can't ignore that. Just because you're a senior, just because you got your acceptance letter, those things have, you have to follow through. Uh, any, any other questions? We are quickly out of time. Yes. You can. Um, I would ask your school where they would prefer it sent to, because they may not check if we resend it. Um, it might they you know they probably checked when they did your admissions. But they probably won't recheck again until we send their final ones, most likely. So I would just give them a call or shoot them an email and say, hey, you know I, I, I want to be considered for the scholarship that you're offering. I would like to send. I'm getting grades in three weeks. I would like to send you a new transcript with an updated GPA that I can be considered based on that GPA. How would you like me to send that to you? Would you like me to mail it to you? Our school is on Naviance, they can send it that way. I can send it electronically through parchment, which which is the best way to do that. Also, in your, um, if your school has an admissions portal that they gave you a password to and all that, sometimes that information will be in there about whether or not they want a midterm or a full term transcript and what dates are acceptable. So, so Sierra College transcripts, so if you're taking it for a high school course, so there's two different ways to take a Sierra College class. You can take a Sierra College class concurrently and get concurrent credit for high school courses. What that usually looks like means it is very similar to a, cor a current course that we offer here. So that's, that would be how we, that's how you get 10 credits for like English at Sierra College. Other courses that people are choosing to take, we would not add to our transcript. They are being taken as a college course. Um, so, so those are two categories. In terms of transcripts, if you're taking the course as a, as, as a high school course to count towards your GPA, to count towards your credits, and your high graduation requirements, we do require transcripts to us to prove the grade that you finished and to award you credit, okay? Um, in terms of college, so you self-reported to colleges what schools you or what cl classes you're taking. If you're taking a Sierra College class, you've listed that. Um, that course, once you've finished it, it's not listed now on your transcripts. Once you've listed it, it will be listed on our transcript. Schools will not accept that as college credit. They will accept that as high school credit. Uh, if you've completed this in high school for your grade, uh, your entrance requirements for college. But in terms of like receiving college credit for your English class, so if you pass A and B, not having to take freshman English, for example, you still have to send transcripts, I would say, to the final school that you actually are going to. So once you've made your admissions decision, the same time you're ordering final transcripts from us, order final transcripts from any other school that you've attended outside of our high school. If you've attended like three other high schools, those high school, that high school information will end up on our transcript. You don't have to order transcripts from each high school you've attended. Just our final transcript and any other college or online like AP type course that you're going to get scores for. Yes, in fact. Usually, yeah. So that usually means that they, they've got their 
Just like in bishops, it's all provisional. So when we sent transcripts earlier this fall, it lists your senior courses, but there's no grades or credits. Like until it will be conditional. It'll probably say waiting a final verification until your graduation is posted and you've ordered your final transcript to be sent. Then it'll be verified that you are not a high school student anymore. Yeah, so if you ordered them through parchment or dog ounce, um, we send those and those are all official transcripts. And, and they wouldn't accept, for, for admissions purposes, they wouldn't accept some paper transcript that we just handed to them. It's got to be signed and sealed and all that stuff. So yeah, so the, it, 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 it's an official one, it's just sent electronically. So when grades come out or when, whatever, mid-January, that's the official grade you send. Do we have to ask you to send them or is that all? Some schools, right? some schools will require uh, what they call mid-year transcripts. Um, I will probably be automatically sending mid-year transcripts for anyone on Um uh, I just think it's best practice and it helps schools out and it helps you guys out typically um, that they're updated in the mid-year. Uh, my kind of reasoning behind that is if there is something that's going on, I think it's you guys are probably much like more likely to be informed about it and have information about it before you get to June. So like, don't, that the whole putting the eggs in the basket, if they have something going on, they're, they're seeing an issue, you want to know about it so you can make other plans or decisions or fixes and that kind of stuff or talk to the school to figure it out before school's over at high school and then you get a letter saying, oh, by the way, we just got your final transcript. Yeah, that grade wasn't good enough for us. Sorry. And then you're stuck in summer and you gotta, you know, scramble or go to JC and like, yeah, it, it's just not pretty when that happens. So that, you, that I mean, that's very rare. I, don't be scared about that. It's extremely uncommon to get things rescinded admissions, but it does happen. Um, so, so yes, transcripts will be sent. I will send them. Um, if you did, a, if it's sendable through Naviance. If you send through parchment, we pay for each one of those. Well, you pay for each one of those, but we can't send them for you through that program. Anything through Naviance, I will be sending it though and uploading. You will have to order transcripts at the end of the year though. I do not send those automatically because you send those to the schools that you're going to. I won't send them to every single school. I send them to the school that you have accepted. And to the California grants. Those are automatically submitted. We don't have to send transcripts to those guys. They get GP verification through our student information system. And it's 3.0, I believe, right? Is that still what it is? So 3.0 is a cutoff. And again, that is a concrete cutoff. If you have a 2.99 the time we submit it, and it's usually it's early spring, right? It's, it's after, our, we submit it after our semester grades are posted, usually in February-ish. Um, if you have a 2.99, that doesn't count. You won't be considered for the GPA. Not our policy, California's policy. Um, unfortunately, it, it happens to students almost every year. So, we got like the circus going on back here. Okay, so any other questions? Um, I don't want to keep you guys any longer than we've told you we would unless you want to stay and ask questions. If there's anything that you guys want to ask that you think would benefit the whole group, go ahead. Otherwise, I will hang out. Emily, we'll probably hang out too for a little bit if you want to ask us some individual questions. Um, again, write down that date. Tell your friends. There's definitely, I mean, I know people that need financial aid that are not here tonight. Tell your friends to come. It's so hard to get people to come to these things. It's, I think it's good information. Um, but if you guys have questions, let me know. Um, try to get the information out to other people about some of the events that are happening in January. Um, tell them that this will be online. Um, they can watch. Um, I would love feedback too. If you guys have things you liked or things you want to know more about, let me know. I always try to adjust my presentations based on what people like or don't like or need more of. Um, so I'm not setting stones. Yes? Where, where will you be able to find this presentation online? Uh, this presentation will be on YouTube. So, so our, we have a link on our school's website that has a big YouTube picture. Okay. Click on that and it'll take you to our account. Um, there's a bunch of other videos. You just find the financial aid senior night 2014, 13, or something like that. Um, title it something you can find it. I'll also post a link to this presentation in a PDF format that you can download as well.
Thank you for coming. If there's no other questions, hope you guys have a great evening. Have a lovely Christmas, you guys. Be safe. Don't drive stupidly or, you know, just dr take things slow. People are in a hurry a lot of times. So just enjoy the weather. Uh, but have a great Christmas. We'll see you guys in January, if not before that. And tell everybody about the January 14th Father Fast Night. Good night. You can be in charge of bringing chips and dip. doing now. Oh. All of her classes, right? And, and Natalie has last year's Spanish, last year's this and that. I didn't and know. she's trying to dance. And she doesn't feel like it. The pressure, the stress makes her yeah. Let her, I mean, I, I mean, we gave a dance for Ingrid and it, it worked out. I mean, as much as I hated to drop dance. You know what? I can't get them to do it. I fight I know, they, they, Ingrid, they, Ingrid has so much other stuff. Now I guess too much stuff, but we didn't dance with the picture. I can't. She knows. 
And Ingrid did too, and I felt terrible. But she's kind of, she's come out of it. Definitely had a part this way. Yeah, I did. Um, uh, yeah, Natalie does, you know, too much.